back at it here for chapter three, which is the expansion part of chapter two. Chapter two is more about the uh, form base, more of the simplistic, um, non-exercise based types of things, although just as valuable. Okay, it doesn't mean that the paperwork or any of that type of information is not important. It doesn't mean that that stress test is not important. The GXT is not important. It just means that it's just a way of getting information that can lead you into, like it says here, the assessment, the prescription, and then adherence to programming. So this is going to be the basis to get into it. Again, a lot of this may be repetitive, but kind of getting back into what it is that you need to understand before you start programming as in the premise of this course. Okay. So as we move through, um, you know, what are we able to do in terms, you know, in terms of phys being physically fit and, you know, the obvious, you know, with physical fitness is the ability to perform without, you know, perform motions movements without undue fatigue and that includes all of those things there occupational activities recreational activities and daily activities as simple as climbing upstairs you know so when we look at it from the perspective of assessment and then you know movement are we able to be cardio respiratorily and you know endured can we have proper mus musculoskeletal fitness do we have proper body weight and body comp do we have proper flexibility and then balance? Now, from previously, it used to look like this. If we were to go into, you know, it used to be one was correct. And then number two, mus it used to be muscle strength and then muscle endurance. And then we never used to have balance. Okay. And these two used to be, these two together made up this right here, muscular, you know, musculoskeletal fitness. So it kind of, it looked like this in some way, shape, or form. But it kind of disappeared, and this is why new information is always coming out, because if we just backtrack on everything, you know, it's gone from what we see here to just, again, back everything right out. And now it's this. Musculoskeletal fitness is going to include both strength and endurance, but they've put a balance component in. And I think that the balance component is helpful because that is going to be something that can be affected across all age groups. Um, balance is critical for anything from um, just moving up and down things, reaching to get something. It goes across all ages, you know, like I said before, from children, you know, when are they going to get their center of gravity under wraps? You know, as a young child, that's why they waddle and they have really wide stances and they kind of like take broken steps. And then as you get older, it's almost like you reverse that and go back to having to relearn everything. So keeping up with that is going to be very, very critical. So don't lose sight of the fact that this right here is strength and endurance. Okay. So... In terms of testing, I agree. Resting blood pressure and heart rate needs to come first because you cannot be doing any of that beforehand. Body comp and body comp is quality for that as well in this position because it's number one. It needs to be done before any exercising goes on anyway, and um, it's very difficult if you're going to even do like it, just for simplistic purposes. It's hard to like do a skin fold test when you have sweaty skin so that makes a big difference as well also think about it from the perspective too that when you do when you do a um a test what you, you know if you're working out it changes water chemistry it changes the muscular um blood flow and that changes how you are able to you know to measure certain things so body comp needs to come before then um balance not taxing on the system definitely worth doing so if we were to put it in a little bit better of order, you know, we go body composition, balance, in this nature, versus putting them together. And then we go into um, cardiorespiratory endurance, muscular fitness, and then flexibility. My concern with this is I really feel like this, come on now. 
should be here. I really feel like that should be the case and this right here is a mess because you know if you're doing muscular strength and endurance in a single session it's it's really hard to you know everybody's gonna have their own interpretation of this personally from my standpoint is it you know if you're doing all of these tests in a single session number one it's a lot number two um, you're taking away the ability to have one each one of those aspects become enhanced. So, you know, putting these four things into one is really good because they should all be tested. They don't take a lot. And then flexibility also gives you a chance to get into a warm up. Whereas, you know, if you're going to do strength and endurance, just say that you're going to be doing um, bench press, uh, leg press, just to name it, you know, leg press or, or squatting, one or the other. Um, and then you're going to do a sit up test. And then maybe um, like, uh, let's see, a push-up test if you're not doing bench pressing, things like that. Um, it just depends on the variation. But putting this before cardio, unless it's, you know, a person has, you know, unless they're doing a one rep max squatting or leg pressing, it, it's really tricky. So, you know, if you have enough time. But again, a single session, what are we talking about? Are we talking about an hour? Are we talking about two hours? Are we talking about the whole day? Um, because ultimately, you could do muscular fitness beforehand and then do cardio later because your legs will have ATP resynthesized, the ability to remove lactic acid if it's even present, but your volume is not very high when you're doing muscular fitness assessments, so it should not translate to a, a horrible cardio score, all right? So just food for thought, but again, everybody is going to have every every expert's going to have their opinion on it. But that just again, that's my own opinion. But putting this beforehand, but again, if it's a single session, again, what is it? Is it an hour? Is it two hours? Like we were saying before, so that also makes a difference because again, trying to fit all of this stuff into an hour, it's just going to become a big giant train wreck. So best case scenario, it should be spread. Me personally, get these four things out of the way in a single session, and then these can be done in. In, in you know the next sessions as you go through and separate them you know that doesn't mean you have to do everything in one shot that's the problem that I think we have to realize that you, just because it's an assessment it doesn't mean you can't put that into a an exercise program and say okay well we're gonna you know we're gonna do a three minute step test okay and that's not gonna be very taxing on the system that could be your you know part of your warm up. You know, so that that's just one way to look at it from that perspective. So when we when we do testing, especially when we're doing like field testing, like in in the field, not field testing where you're doing large groups, we need to think about two things. We need to think about well, actually, three things according to the slide. But you know, test validity, reliability, and objectivity. Now, go. Let's start with the last one first. Objectivity. Are you know is the, is the data really the data? Okay. It's not subjective. It's not me looking at something and saying, oh, it looks this way. No, it's what the score is. So if a person runs a mile and a half in uh, 15 minutes and 37 seconds, that's an objective score. That is exactly what it was, unless, of course, there's some error by the reader who doesn't know how to read the numbers. Okay, but that shouldn't be happening. All right, so that, let's throw that out. But objectivity is, 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 that's the reality. That is not a descriptive nature it's what the numbers are showing okay um, so that's there validity is something valid are you physically measuring what is supposed to be measured and they use it in one simple word accuracy okay so uh, the test validity is is what you're completing what you're supposed to be completing and then reliability is is it able to be repeated okay so if you were to look at this perspective of those two, validity, validity and reliability, which one is um, more appropriate? And you're going to be like, oh, well, if it can be repeated, then it's definitely got to be that. It's like, well, not necessarily. What you need to think about is if a test is, if a test is supposed to measure what it's supposed to measure, then it will, you can give it the reliability. Okay, so for example, if you're doing a leg press, a leg press is a valid, meaning it's going to measure what it's supposed to be measuring. It's a valid lower body, particularly gluten quadricep dominant motion 
that's good for the lower body. Um, if you're trying to do a bench press, that is not a, or, or excuse me, if you're trying to do a leg press to show upper body strength, then it's not valid. It's not showing, you're not getting the correct strength number, okay? Um, if you're trying to do an upper body assessment for strength, you're not going to do a push-up test. That's going to be an endurance test. It's not valid for that purpose, okay? But then um, the other aspect, too, is when it's reliable, what we need to understand is that it, you know, if it's a push-up test, it has to have standards, it has to be consistent, and it needs to be able to be repeated. So a push-up test is a perfect example of that. A sit-up test is a perfect example of that. They are things that you can do all the time the same way with the same directions. So that's what we're referring to there. So really the more important of them is, you know, if it's valid. If it's valid, if it's not valid, then reliability means nothing. Okay, if something is reliable, it doesn't mean it's valid. That's what we're referring to, Okay. So when you're looking at research, for example, when we're, you know, we're going through research, if you're looking and seeing if a co the validity coefficient, if it's a, above 0.8, that means that it's good, it, there, it, it's, a, it's, a good, it's good validity, okay? That also means that there's going to be small standard errors of estimate, that's what this stands for, and there's good sensitivity and specific, uh, specificity, which means you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, it's, 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 it's getting what it needs to get. Okay. So there's your reliability. We kind of hit on that. Reliability coefficients, if they're greater than 0.9, all right, if it's below that, you know, you're going to have, um, you know, if, if it's below that, you're going to have um, not as high of a reliability, meaning that it's maybe it's not what it's supposed to be. So this is what I was referring to here. Poor reliability equals poor poor validity, but good reliability does not equal good. See, that's what I was saying to you before. Just because something can be retested and tested and tested does not mean it's valid, and it has to be for that. So you know, just just keep that in the back of your mind. So an obje objectivity. Similarly, trained technicians get similar results. A lot of times, what you'll hear this referred to is you may hear this term as well. Enter. Rater reliability. Okay, similarly trained technicians get similar results. Inter rater reliability or object objectivity is basically saying that you are, you know, the per a tester will get the same scores each time. So again, a push up test, a tester, unless they don't have the proper unless they don't have the proper training or things like that that's where things can get a little bit tricky. But basically what we're saying is that the inner rater, between two raters, they can you know see the same thing, get the same data, understand the same stuff, okay? So un understand that you know, inter-rater reliability and objectivity are kind of the same thing. All right, so um, when we're talking about things like predictive or you know, predictive equations or prediction equations, Understand that it's predicting, all right? It's not going to be an end-all, be-all. It may not be the exact, but it's a way that we can get specific numbers that we can get for certain measurements, okay? With, by, excuse me, by basically really uh, predicting the value of what it's going to be through statistical analysis, basically saying that over and over again, these numbers are shown to be fairly consistent and they're they're very they're very accurate even though they may not be exact okay so that's one of the things with these types of of um, equations that we have to understand they may not give you the exact number but understand that they may be good enough and give you fairly decent results okay so if you look here you know this is an example of if we go back to you know an equation these are the scores. What we're saying here is that we're getting, you know, average percentage of body fat. This is the upper limit. This is the lower limit. And what we're saying is this is the difference in scores. Now, you know, it's basically five point, just say five point eight. We're saying that there's a, you know, there's a, there could be a discrepancy, higher or lower, positive or negative, away from the standard deviation. Okay, meaning that it's gonna, there are gonna be scores within that, but that's what we're looking for is that within those standard deviations that we're getting similar scores. 
and that can happen with equations as long as you don't have too many. Like if you look here, there are no outliers within those two standard deviations. So that's really important to understand. All right. So here, and you know, and this is oh, there's only one table. Okay. So if we're looking here, you know, what are what are we going to be doing? You know, what are we reference? You know, our reference measures. Uh, maximal force for muscular strength, um, VO2 max for cardiorespiratory endurance, um, you know, fat-free mass um, versus, you know, DB is body density, fat-free mass, and then a percentage of body fat. Those are all things that we can do, okay? And then lastly, with flexibility, you can do a range of motion at a joint. So we can, we can do uh, a couple of different ways. You can do certain things like sit and reach, or you can do uh, goniometry, or actually, like they say here, x-ray as well. And then go down the line here, we can see what we can do, um, what are the predictions, and then what is the, the measurement that you're going to do it for, okay? And those obviously can vary, um, but they're direct and indirect, okay? We can get direct or indirect measures depending upon what they are. Um, now, if you look, a lab method is usually going to be fairly direct, the problem with body comp is it's still indirect because you're not physically getting a sample of body comp. You're not the the most direct measure for body composition would be is if you were to not be morbid, if you were dead and we were able to basically disassemble your body and measure the all the fat that was in your system because that would be a true number. So every body comp measure is going to be an indirect method. All right. So what are we looking for? you know, in terms of administration interpretation, um, you know, pre-test instructions are all correct. They're following specific guidelines. Um, the administration is well-practiced, well-rehearsed, well-versed, okay? And then the results, you're getting precise results that will give you a bunch of data that can then be averaged or looked at or individually looked at so that you can basically give specific specifics to what the um, the individual who's taking the test is getting so that's where we need to be very consistent with everything so when it you know we've gone through the you know these assessment components it's like okay that's great now what do we got to do we got to worry about program design and program design is going to be very critical because you have to have these components in there you have to have your specificity of training okay you have to understand what that is you know it's like are you training for specifics. What are you training for? Are you training to get stronger? Are you training to be able to go longer? Are you training to be able to run faster, etc.? So that's going to be very important. You have to provide proper stimulus or proper overload. And then you have to progress accordingly. Okay. You need to know where the initial values are so you know where to start. Um, inter individual variability. Understand that even though you may just say you're doing group training, you need to know that each person is going to be varied. Okay, they're going to have different different aspects, even though they may be very similar in how they perform, they may change differently when they're going through the program design. Diminishing returns and reversibility. Okay, so diminishing returns, you're, you know, you know, when you think about it from the perspective of, um, from, a, from a strength or a, um, when you're thinking about it from, Are you really getting what you're putting out? Okay. So when things basically, so what, what we're saying here is that, you know, if one thing is, you know, if you look at it from a, like an economical standpoint, if, you, if things decrease, okay, if you have just say, you know, certain, just say your upper body strength decreases, okay. What that means is that, you know, just because the upper, it doesn't mean the lower is going to. It just, something is changing and it really is going to affect how you are going to be able to perform, okay? So, it, it just, it's really, it's, it, and that can be frustrating for people because they think that it's it's one way or another. So, um, So, yeah, so basically at some point here, you know, you're going to keep giving, keep giving, keep giving, and then the amount of return. So as a, let's see, I guess another good way to explain it would be the beginner, okay? 
the beginner is always going to have these vast improvements if everything stays the same, everything stays constant. But eventually over time, you're going to keep that point as a fixture and it, you know, eventually it's going to slow down. You're going to diminish your return. So that means that you have to change progression. You have to change overload and specificity because you want to keep those returns as high as possible. But eventually at some point, it's going to be a breakthrough of that. Okay. Where, you know, an elite person is only going to be able to make so much, so much gain. Okay, so it's the same thing here with diminishing returns. And then reversibility, we're talking about, you know, if you stop if you stop doing it, you're going to lose it. Okay, if you don't use it, you lose it, kind of a mentality. All right. So with prescription, we have to think about modality. What 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 are we going to be using? Um, the intensity, you know, and it depends on what we're doing. Is it is it cardio? So then we can determine speed, we can determine incline, things like that for you know, for strength and endurance, we're going to think about weight, you know, added weight to certain things. Is it body weight with added weight, etc.? cetera? Um, what's the duration? What's the frequency? And then the rate of progression. All right. And this goes back to the, the mentality of the fit VP, you know, frequency. So frequency, intensity, time, type, volume and progression okay that's pretty standard of course our course work but across organizations as well and that's going to help us to get through the the prescription and get us what we need all right so in terms of program progression you're going to have your initial conditioning all right now this is for those um so this is where it gets tricky deconditioned people who have never trained before but then those need familiarization. That could be people who have been previous exercisers, but also think about it from the standpoint of you may have to take a person who has gone through a very rigorous training session and then re-familiarize them with certain things, okay? And depending upon the person, uh, a very elite person may only need to do that for a week, all right? You're, they're getting back to the basics and they're getting back to different exercising habits. And a lot of times this familiarization will be something that will occur as you come um, out of your off season. After you've been through your season, you have that short period of time where you're basically recovering and doing very minimal stuff. And then you're going to come back to training and it's going to take a re-familiarization. So that's your initial conditioning. It doesn't mean that every person that does initial conditioning is deconditioned. It just means that there's a there can be certain... It's just basically starting over from scratch and getting yourself back. But again the athlete is going to get themselves back to you know form quicker because they're not deconditioned a deconditioned person needs to take a longer period of time and that's why it says up to six weeks all right the improvement component it's an aggressive progression and it can last anywhere from four to eight months and that's what you're really trying to push hard for that and then maintenance is basically keeping that base adding variety, adding different activities, adding different things that they like, that, and even giving them things that they don't like because they don't like the way it is, it's going to be, it's only going to help them, you know, and that's why a lot of times trainers kind of get, you know, trainers, coaches get stuck in these ruts because they're like, well, my players or my client doesn't like doing certain things. It's like, well, they don't like it because it's challenging a lot of times. And when things are challenging, people don't really want to do it. So, you know, by not giving them those challenging aspects really can affect them. All right, so adherence, you know, what is it that really comes down to? This is going to be more, you know, adherence really comes down to a lot of things, but goals are one of them, okay? Um, do they have any incentives? You know, what are the, you know, are there any compliments to it? Is there a threat of disease? Those are going to be motivations that are going to keep them adhered to their goal, but they shouldn't be the reason why motiv it shouldn't be the only reason why motivation is there, all right? It should be a driving force, but it shouldn't be the reason, all right? If, if you're, if the doctor's like, well, you know, if you don't work out, you know, you're, you know, that whole one cheeseburger away from a heart attack, that can scare people, but it doesn't keep them motivated for a long period of time, or it may not keep them motivated for a period of time, because after a while, they'll be like, well, I don't like doing this. There has to be other things. Incentives, giving people constant incentives is great, but if it's, a, if it's not for intrinsic reasons, then that's going to be a problem, Okay. So those are factors that come into play. Um, journaling, making achievable goals, and a sense of control are going to be ways that you're going to stay with it. Journaling is really good because it keeps everything in order and you know what you're doing. Okay, But adherence really comes down to, and I definitely agree with this, adopting behavioral techniques here. 
uh, behavior mod is always going to be one of those things that really challenges people and it's going to be one of those things that really um, makes people stay with it because they're the ones that are choosing what to do. They're the ones that are really working hard to reach that achievable goal. Um, there are a bunch of different models and beliefs. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I know that we've definitely, you know, health belief model, you know, that's basically saying that if you believe in that, like uh, people who drink kombucha, they think that they're creating a better uh, um their they their their um their bacteria their biome you know that they're thinking that that's going to be something that's really good for them that you know their gut their gut bacteria their gut you know biome that's going to be very important for them so they believe that if they drink kombucha it'll help that but does that mean it's necessarily going to happen um Jamie Lee Curtis and her you know Activia you know that you know people believe that that bacteria that you know um, is going to help them to keep, stay regular. It's like that doesn't, you know, not for everybody, but it could, you know, or what's really in it that's causing it to, you know, but people, if they believe it, they'll do it. All right. The trans theoretical model, that's the more common one that we learned through, um, through our sports psychology class of the pre-contemplation, contemplation, um, preparation, uh, action, maintenance, and, um, those, you know, and then uh, termination, those are your six steps for that. And they're the ones that people follow to be able to stick with, you know, what, what area of change are they. So, um, but there are these here. You can refer to them in your book if you need to. But um, understand that, you know, one of those may be more, re you know, rational for your, for your people that you're working with. Okay. Um. So, you know, with behavior change, again, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, make sure that they're actively involved in the decision-making process and planning, you know, social support, education, um, and why. You know, there, a lot of times there needs to be the why of exercise, okay? Um, Self-efficacy and confidence, and then um, uh, reasonable expectations. Don't assume that you're going to lose 15 pounds in two weeks, although it could happen, especially for new people. It, if it doesn't happen, it's not, a, it's not, it's not like it's the end of the world, but at the same time, that expectation was way too high. Okay. Um, positive reinforcement, avoid backsliding, but you know, not avoid, but see where those trends are going that are causing the backslide. Um, instill client belief, um, that basically, if they do it, it'll change, all right? They're the ones that are in control of that change, okay? That's going to help them. Belief is a very strong factor in, in, pos in positive change. So um, help clients understand their source of motivation. Where is it coming from? You know, is it anger that they've built up all day long that causes these things to happen? I mean, is it... Um, something where, you know, their wife or their spouse is getting, you know, their wife, their husband, significant other is getting involved with them and it's causing a better source of motivation because now they have a, a counterpart that's working with them. Lots of different things. Um, enhancing exercise motivation. So for here, you know, why are they there? Make them be able to feel confident. Increase their autonomy. Autonomy meaning they feel they're their uh, their belief in their ability. You want them to believe in themselves so that they can feel like they can do it over and over again. And then relatedness. What you know have to put a relatedness. You have to put some relationship back into it. Okay. Um, avoid uh, off-putting behaviors um, of you know that are there. Uh, sense of competency. We've already kind of hit on. Intrinsic motivation I hit on earlier when I was in a couple slides ago and then integrate behavior modification model theories to encourage adherence. So any of those modification theories that may work and, and you know more people may stick to certain ones than others. It's just maybe they don't stick to any of them and it's just their their own belief system. Okay, so you know one of the ways of of adhering but also a way that we've kind of increased our, our knowledge, you know, maybe not to the best extent for the general public, but still understanding is through the use of different wearables, okay? And you can see here that, you know, we, we you know all about them. Um, 
active workstations sometimes can be, to me, I think these can be distracting for people who have a hard time multitasking, but it doesn't mean that they can't work. So just be aware, you know, if you're trying to sit at a desk and do an elliptical, but again, if you're sitting at a desk all day long, the, you know, maybe doing like one of those foot ellipticals may not be the best thing for you because again, are you sitting upright? Are you locking your, your legs into where they're supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of factors. So still hurt yourself by doing it, but you know, is it a standing workstation? You know, it just depends on, on each person. So just don't think that you have to take your whole office space and just make it into like active. You can still have desks and stuff. It just means that we have to change the way people move throughout the day. Um, you know, pedometers and accelerometers, these are things that people wear all the time. They can detect where they're at, you know, and, and you know, when people say, oh, I didn't hit my step my steps for today, it's a way to track. But it shows them, it's a reinforcer that, oh, I didn't move as much today. I didn't do this as much today. So the one thing, neither accurately estimates energy expenditure of exercise. So again, if it, it still gives you an indicator to where you are physically, where you're moving throughout the day. So even though they may not be the most accurate, they still give you something. Okay, if you're up moving around, it's going to acknowledge the fact that you're up moving around. So if just say your Apple Watch shows that you burn 800 calories, but you know, not including exercise, that means that you were pretty active throughout the day. But you know, if you the next day you were like, well, I only use it only burned 300 calories, and you're like, yeah, I really didn't move a lot yesterday. But that see what I'm you know we're going with this is that it's a way to track, even though it may not be the most accurate. So give some feedback to the person. Heart rate monitors are another one, you know, that you can detect these things. Heart rate monitors are are, are fairly accurate, um, but again, there there can be factors that affect it. So you know, depending upon um, placement, is usually one of them. So we have to make sure of that. A lot of the heart rate monitors are now working directly with. Um, with cell phone companies, they're working with newer companies that are putting out like these large uh, projections where you can see them. Like you know, um, My Zone is a good one that people use. So um, you know, Polar has really good ones. So they're there. And again, it, it, the high, the more calories you or the the higher your heart rate, the more calories you burn, things like that. And you're supposed to be in those particular zones are going to be appropriate and important. Okay. So. Um, you know, just be aware, put, um, heart rate monitoring for your, um, your smartphone. So like even you know, like a Fitbit, uh, Apple watches, those types of things, they again are not going to be, they may not be as accurate, but it, again, it depends on, you know, where it's placed, but it also depends on, you know, again, what are you looking at it for? If you're, if it's your end all be all, then it's not the right mean for that. So. GPS monitors for your for going and then for your smartphones, they're great because they can show you distances run. Garmin is an awesome company for this. Okay, they're one of they they can track your run wherever you go, and their GPS systems are I think one of the best out there in terms of of, of guidance to where you're going. So um, you know just be aware. And they can they can do um, certain of the watches can do swimming they can do um, running they can do rowing so there's a, a biking not rowing they can do uh, biking so there's a lot of things that can come into play when it comes to GPS monitoring and it, again it's a way to track things it's a way to show you what you did okay um, I'm not huge on these not a very uh, huge uh, fan of gaming. But they are there, you know, again, if it's a way that people can get moving in some way, I'm never going to take that away from them. If it's rehab purposes, I'm not going to take it away from them. But understand that, you know, if you're trying to use, you know, uh, an alternative form of reality to be able to get you to move, then that means, are you really moving? That's my concern. So it depends on what it is. But... You know, for a while there, people were thinking that the you know ten, the Nintendo Wii was going to be the the saving grace for people moving, but again, that kind of fell by the wayside. So we'll see. I mean, if they prove me wrong, I hope they do because if something comes out where that can make you more movement based, then you know that only makes things better. Um, you know, persuasive technology. There's things out there, especially you know now. It seems like social media is just you know taking off. Um, 
in terms of social networking, but it makes everything interactive. But persuasive technology, it's just what what is it that they're using that's making you do that? Are they, you know, like uh, what is it? Those things that the the sweat bands, the things that go around like your abdominal area. I don't even know the name of them because I think they're a crock. But people are going to use those. Now that's probably not the best thing, but they, you know, it may be something that you know. Again, if you're not moving, it's not even going to matter. So. Um, persuasive technologies, things that are going to change attitudes and behaviors. You're hoping that what they are, they're positive persuaders, but again, doesn't always work that way. So, um, but you know, social networking is great, but again, it's just like anything that Americans do. Sometimes I feel like it's in excess and that can be a potential problem later on down the road. So, um, you know, take these things for a grain of salt, you know, understand the assessments, understand that there's going to be change and there's a need for behavior techniques. And then understand that why we're testing is because we want to make things reliable and valid or valid and reliable in order of operation so that when we test, we know that it's time to make this programming accurate. Okay. So again, that's chapter three. Um, just, you know, simple things here that, you know, we, you know, we know about the five components of fitness. We know about uh, testing. Testing order can be very funky. It, it can be something that, you know, it, Everybody is going to do their testing in a different way, but it does not mean that we don't assess in some way, shape, or form, whether it be um, in a professional manner, whether it be in a nonchalant manner where you're not really making it a test, but you're observing and watching and seeing and doing. Okay. So again, um, thanks for listening and um, we'll see you soon.